Hello everyone, welcome to one more Iberamia 22 warm up. Today, Cristina and I have the pleasure to receive our invited speaker, Hello. Ricardo. Welcome to one more. Uh, and the uh, Iberamia friends, uh, Antonio with us in the studio. Cristina, uh, we'll do the presentations, please, Cristina. Yes, welcome everybody. It is a pleasure again, to be presenting our third speaker in this pre-event, in this Iberamia 22 pre-event. Just a reminder, Iberamia is going to be, this year, is going to be, um, if COVID allows us, uh, in-person activity, an in-person conference, and I'm waiting everybody there. It's going to be in Cartagena de Indias, Colombia, uh, from November 23 to 25, the call for papers is open and the deadline is May 29. We are waiting for paper submissions and for you there. Here in the studio, I have Marisa, that is from the uh, Laboratório Nacional de Computação Científica. We also have Antonio Berlanga, from Carlos III, Universidade, Universidade Carlos III de Madrid, and myself from the Universidade Federal do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, Unirio. Today I have a great pleasure of introducing our invited speaker. He's a very special person. And, and as you can see, he's so special that he, that he is a, a Chilean, Catalan, American and a little, a little bit Brazilian AI researcher. And he has an extensive resume and I just uh, going to highlight some few points. Let me read for you who is Ricardo Beziat. So um, Ricardo is a professor at the Northeastern University at the Silicon Valley campus. So this is a very good thing to be in both sides of the U.S. country. He's a director of research and, uh, at the Institute of Experiential AI of the Northeastern University. And he's also a part-time professor at Universidade de Chile and Universidad Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. He's everywhere. So he was the VP of research at Yahoo Labs until 2016, and from 16 to 20, he was the CTO of a Silicon Valley tech company. This mixture of academics and industry provided him a unique background to talk to us about ethics and AI. Without much ado, Ricardo, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Cristina, for the nice introduction. Thank you, Marisa, for the opportunity to be here. So today I will talk about uh, challenges in, in AI ethics. So just to give you uh, uh, an overview, very quick overview of uh, this new Institute of Northeastern, uh, we want to focus in real practical AI. That means AI that is uh, has humans involved, Typically, we say human in the loop. I will, I will mention later that I prefer to have humans in control. And also, it's not only about big data, it's also about the small data, about the right data, and about uh, better algorithms. And you can see everything uh, in, in the website that is in the corner, ai.northsystem.edu. So I will talk uh, first about some problems that we have in, in AI today. So this is my own personal bias of four areas where we have problems. So discrimination, phrenology, a lack of uh, semantic understanding, and then uh, unsustainable use of resources. And then we, I want to discuss more generic issues, like uh, we have so many principles, and really that they shouldn't be called principles. We have cultural differences. We have regulation issues. And the most difficult one, we have our cognitive biases. And then. I will try to, to say a few things we can do to, to mitigate all these problems. So let's start with the main one, which is uh, the course of bias. Uh, basically, you have an algorithm that receives bias data. The first bias we have here is that we think uh, 
we think about bias in a negative way because every every time in the news bias is associated by by, by a negative thing but bias in, in is neutral in, in principle so bias is a systematic deviation to reference point but this could be positive right even information is biased because uh, information if you receive uh, let's say white noise an algorithm cannot do anything with white noise so information itself is biased the problem that sometimes is, is, is dangerous. And then an algorithm should maybe ask the question is, do you have to be neutral with any negative bias? Do I have to be fair in, our, in, in my outcomes? And the, these questions are really never asked too much today. And then you get the same bias in the output. And even worse, sometimes you get the amplified bias. And if the bias is amplified, we cannot blame only the data. And this is what uh, I, I did in my uh, CICM 2018 bias on the web paper, where I showed that there are other sources of bias, like the function that we're trying to optimize, and also in the feedback loop between the system and the user. So what is being fair? We should have equality, but sometimes equality doesn't work. And then we, we, we have equity, so we compensate with an affirmative action, which can be seen as a positive bias. But really what we want is justice, but justice takes too long to, to, to exist, and that's why we, we use equity in, in the meantime. If you're interested in the topic, I will recommend this uh, 2020 uh, documentary, Coded Bias. Uh, that is uh, mainly done by, by African-American women. And this is much better than the dilemma of the social networks that was done mainly by white American men. And uh, last year, uh, a bit more than one year ago, we did uh, a panel with other computer scientists and, and one federal judge of the US on this topic. And you can find this in YouTube if you want to see. Uh, I, I was. Uh, lucky to be included in the discussion. So not always we need to ask these questions. If this is a non-technical question, it's a societal question. But you need to ask these questions if you harm people. So you need to be careful about the results of the algorithm if people is involved. So to solve this problem, some people suggest to devise the input, but you don't know all the biases in the input. Some other people try to tune the algorithm so the model itself deals with bias. And then you can also bias the output. But if you have, for example, a search in LinkedIn and, and you have 10 women and 40 men, the best you can do is to have gender parity in the top 20, not in the top 50. But the truth is that we cannot bias. We are just doing bias mitigation. As I said, there are many hidden biases that you only learn uh, because they are not intended intended consequences of your system. So the first time that, that this problem reached the headline news probably was when uh, ProPublica uh, accused uh, that the system that was being used uh, for uh, supporting decisions in uh, American prisons was racist. So they say that the race, racial bias was two to one so African-Americans against the white people. However, uh, later was proven incorrect. Uh, for example, Cynthia Rudin and, and her team showed that the, the real bias was is, with age. And then uh, there was a correlation between race and age. And then that looked like was a racial bias. Uh, it was a racial bias. Uh, so this shows also how difficult it is to, to do these claims because there are many ways to, to analyze data and you may come with different, um, different answers. So the COMPASS data set must be one of the most used uh, data sets for an, an analyzing bias and the results are very, very different depending on, on how you look at them. So when we have this kind of uh, public algorithms that implement or support a public policies, we can ask if a secret algorithm is ethical because of transparency. However, we should also ask if the public algorithm is safe because then people can game it. And of course, the answer depends on the application and will never be in one of the extremes. You need some transparency, but also you need some, some safety against uh, gaming. 
in a very interesting paper that was published uh, four years ago by Klember et al. Uh, um, uh, that was uh, from the request of the uh, Economic Research Bureau of the US. They analyzed the problem of uh, bales in the state of New York. These were like a very large uh, data set of uh, three quarter million cases. And they found that they, they could, if the system was doing the right predictions, they could decrease the crime rate in 25% while decrease the prison rate in 42% either keeping the same prison rate or keeping the same crime rate. So it looked like they were, the system was much better than the judges. Even, even worse, if the predictions were correct, the judges were bailing half of the most dangerous criminals, the 1% most dangerous, which failed to appear in court 56% and reoffended in 62% of the cases. So this is an example where the bias is amplified. Let me show you that. So here I have the distribution of people that arrive to the court. So 49% are black, 33% are Hispanic. So in total, 82%. However, in red, I put the actual population in the state of New York from these two minorities, and they both together only add 32%. So already we have a bias on which people arrive to court, it's more than double. The judges are racist. So you can see from the numbers, the black percentage goes from 49% to 57%, while the Hispanic decreases a little bit, maybe because they're more white Hispanics, and then still the minority increases to 89%. So what happened with the algorithm? Well, the algorithm learn to be racist. And this is very interesting because the only demographic feature of the algorithm that was used was the age. They not even use the gender, although most of the people were men. And here is the result. So the algorithm learned to be racist and increase the black percentage to 60%, learn also to keep decreasing the Hispanic percentage to 30%, but in total increased 1% from 89 yeah. to 90%. Yes? Yeah. Yes, I think that you should uh, change. The, we cannot see your slides. So you are oh. talking about the numbers and we, we cannot, we are not following. Um, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, too bad that you didn't tell me that. So, so what, are, what are you seeing? I think uh, Marisa needs to show the slides. Marisa. Uh, you, you, if you put like um full screen put full screen yeah now we can see yes perfect okay i had the same before that's weird okay so you can see it now yes we can see now yes okay so basically the system learned to be racist only from the data of the each case now we can we can tune the system so if we uh, use the, the lowest uh, racist the less racist judge this is the last line on the table then uh, still the system can improve decrease the crime rate in 23 percent uh, and decreasing the racism to to 49%, so basically the same as, as the input. So at least you are not increasing the, the bias in the system. So what is happening? If the, if the predictions are correct, this is just what is happening. So basically the additional people, if you ask the system to send some additional people to prison, you will get the top people according to the prediction. However, if you see what the judges are doing, it looks like random. They're basically sending to prison people that is randomly chosen from the whole distribution. And this is part of the problem. Now, remember that using AI for justice has one big problem is that you are normalizing, you're averaging the decision. So justice should be individual 
to justice should depend in the context of every person. And data doesn't capture the context, and then you are in some sense averaging the, the, the prediction between many people, so you change an individual decision for a group decision, and that's a really illegal, uh, but some people is doing this. And then we have a dilemma. So one, the only one advantage of algorithms is that they don't have noise. So basically they don't have a variance on the decision. So we can ask, what do we prefer? A bias algorithm that at least is just in the same, that always does the same for the same kind of case, or we have a noisy judge that basically this, depending on the mood or the time of the day, will have a different answer. So basically, uh, algorithms are like C, so that like the target C, and I'm saying that the judges are like B. But the, the truth is that judges are also biased, so basically we need to compare C with D, and then it's not an easy comparison. So I was using an article from Daniel Kahneman and, and collaborators that he published in Harvard Business Review in 2016, but last year, he uh, finally published a book on the topic, noise, and, and, and basically explains when noise is even worse than bias. Well, in 2020, because of uh, bias problems on facial recognition, especially, especially with African-American population, um, the big companies decided to stop selling this to, to, to the police. Uh, we also at the US, uh, US Technology Policy Committee of ACM urged to suspend the use of facial recognition in, in June 2020, but it was too late. Why? Because these, uh, these tools were already being used by police. And for example, in September 2020, the second black person was arrested wrongfully. And this happens in other contexts. For example, here is some work from Stanford where you see stereotypes depending on the, your ethnic background. So if you're Hispanic, you're the janitor. If you're Asian, maybe you're the secretary. And if you're white, you are finally the sheriff. So this happens also in language models, very large language models. Uh, for example, here is the size of uh, major language models until last year. So we are getting to the point of 1.6 trillion parameters, which are very large. So we'll go back to, to this later. But in um, but there, they have found many, many biases. For example, you have anti-Muslim bias. So if you write in GPT-3, two Muslims walk into A, you get these completions. So you see that most of the completions are violent. And this, uh, this one year ago, these uh, researchers uh, checked the, the bias and they found that Muslims have four times more com violent completions than Christians. And if you want to know which are the less uh, dangerous religions in, in news, these are Buddhist and atheist. But can be more complicated, for example, when... Again, again, we are seeing your wrong slide. I think that you are are sharing the, the wrong screen because we right now we are we are seeing something else. Maybe maybe the problem is that the, the, the system doesn't share well the, the window so I will share the screen. Perfect. Maybe maybe that's the problem. Okay. And I'll be I'll be here. So ah uh, but oh okay I don't have permission for a stream yard to share my screen. Oh. Marisa, can you give her him permission to? Yeah, the problem is that that is. Uh... Well, what you should do is should put your screen inside. The... Yeah, but the problem is that uh, right now I will need to. Uh... Okay, now we are seeing your your. Okay. Yeah. I'll be, I'll yeah, be I will use this. yeah, I will use this because what happens is that. Um, I need to give permission to share the screen and, and that will apply to leave of stream journals or that. But I will use this one. The problem it doesn't have animation, but it's okay. So, so here the, there are some examples of, of uh, more complicated issues. For example, uh, in 2020, when the UK decided to, uh, to predict the grades to avoid uh, the national exam to enter the university, basically they discriminated 
they discriminated uh, uh, poor people. Or for example, this one more interesting, the case of Deliveroo in Italy also one year ago, the, the court found that the, this uh, delivery service was discriminating some, uh, some riders that couldn't deliver at night. So basically this was, is an example of when the optimization function is creating the bias because no one thought that they need to balance the, the, the work that you give to, to, to riders. Um, so, but can be really bad. So this is the worst example that this happens in the Netherlands uh, when um, they were using a system to find um, basically uh, uh, they were to find the people that were cheating on child care benefits you still you, you first have an ethical issue here because you, you shouldn't try to find cheating in poor people but more on rich people and this affected 26,000 families maybe more than 100,000 people and at the end the whole government of Netherlands had to resign a bit more than one year ago that this also happened in January 2021. Now, there are thousands of problems, and you can go to this place, Incident Database of AI, where they have more than 2,000 cases of problems that are happening with uh, the usage, the wrong usage of AI. But then you have other problems like uh, what is called physiognomy. So, for example, some people trying to uh, predict uh, personality traits from people. For example, uh, what is your sexual preference? What is your political preference? Can you be a criminal, like in, in the Minority Report movie? And this is like modern phrenology. So basically, uh, believing that your face, or for example, uh, the shape of your brain will tell you about your personality is a pseudoscience. Uh, for example, one of the big believers on this was this Dr. Cesare Lombroso in, in Italy that in the 19th century, 19th century recollected hundreds of skulls because he believed that the skull was different for criminals. Of course, this was poor people that, that no one retired his, their body in the morgue, so there's already a bias. And, but he really believed that because here in the left is his skeleton, because he left his skeleton as, I guess, ground truth of what a good person is. But can be worse. So, for example, uh, in 2019, uh, researchers from MIT published a paper that claimed that you can basically reproduce uh, your face from your voice. I can believe maybe that everything below my nose has to do with the way I, I, I speak. But for me, it will be very hard to believe that any that has any connection to the ears, your hair, your eyes, the shape of your whole face, and so on. But the, even some people claim that they can guess your name from your face. So this is a patent application from, from Mitre that claims that looking at your face, they can predict your name. I don't know what they do with all the um, adopted children from other countries, because in that case, for sure, they, they cannot predict you. So this is my master phrenology algorithm. From your voice, I can predict your face. And from your face, I can know your name. I can know if you are a political opposer if you are gay and if you are criminal. So this is very dangerous. I mean, you shouldn't do this. And sadly, some people is doing this. The third problem is when you have a stupid models. So in 1976, George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. He was talking about statistics, but basically the same can be said about uh, machine learning. This is just advanced statistics. These models cannot deal with semantics, with ambiguous semantics. These models cannot deal with irrational behavior. And then create, they create irrational behavior. For example, when Elon Musk said, use Signal, this was also one year ago, when he was talking about the chat app, but some, some uh, automated software that using at, uh, Twitter data from influencers in the stock market, saw so that they, he was saying that they should buy a stock from Signal Advance, a company in Texas, and then this company increased their, their value in 400%. Well, that company was very happy, but the users that bought this stock following these models were not very happy. They lost a lot of money. But then 
the, the things can be really, really stupid. For example, here on the right, I have an example of adversarial AI, where if you change one pixel, you see, for example, there's a white pixel in some of the things. A horse becomes a frog, a deer becomes an airplane, a horse becomes a dog, a sheep becomes an airplane, and then you, you, you think what this model is learning if with one pixel you can change the prediction. Clearly, it's not learning what we learn, so it's not really the same thing that we understand by learning. But even there are things that are even look funny, but they're even more dangerous. For example, someone, this is also partly a human error, someone in Facebook decided to uh, use an English-trained uh, hate language model and then decided that the town of Bitche in France shouldn't have a Facebook page because it was a bad word. Uh, the people from the town had to wait three weeks because no one was uh, reading their complaints to finally get back their Facebook page. And if they were using the Facebook page for, for example, for COVID announcements, this could really harm a lot of people. So this is the problem with unintended consequences. So we need to remember the limitations of these systems. For example, it's very hard to forget to filter because to learn, you need to abstract things. And I always like to recall this amazing uh, story by uh, Borges, Funes de Memorius, that was a person that couldn't forget anything. And then if you find him in the street and, and, and tell him what you did in the last hour, you have to wait maybe more than an hour because to, to, to tell you what you have done in an hour maybe takes more than one hour. Second, you cannot learn what is not in the data. And this is what happened when Uber killed a woman in Arizona in 2018. You cannot have all possible types of accidents in the data. So you cannot have what will happen in the future. So it's a very hard problem because you don't need to interpolate, also you need to extrapolate, and that's much harder for, for machine learning. Also very important, data does not capture everything. For example, data doesn't capture the context of, of, a, of a court. So justice, for justice, data is just a bad proxy. And in many cases, it's still a bad proxy. And then accuracy is not the key. I don't care if you tell me that you work 90% of the time. What, you, what I want to know is what happens when you doesn't work. For example, if you go to an elevator and the elevator says works 99% of the time, you will not go into the elevator, of course. I will not, I wouldn't. But if it says the elevator doesn't work 1% of the time, but when that happens, it stops, I will go there because I know it's safe. And this is what is missing today in machine learning. I want to know that when you don't work, it's safe. For example, false negatives might be worse than false positives, especially in health. And we need a little bit of uh, humbleness. If you don't have a confidence of a prediction, a smart people will say, I don't know. Today, I don't see any system, any classification system that when they have like below 80% confidence says, I don't know. This will be really a smart. So until artificial intelligence doesn't do this, it's not very smart. And then we have the waste of resources. This is the last problem. For example, you have uh, the carbon footprint of these things. It's 57 years of an average human life when you train only a 200 million parameters transformer. Or you use between one or $3 million in, in power. Uh, and that's something similar is happening with blockchain. I'm not we'll talk about that. That's even worse. And this is the paper that, that that Bender and Gebru et al. published in uh, last year, in fact. Uh, this was the paper that basically led to Timmy Gebru to be laid off in, in Google, that Margaret Mitchell couldn't use her name there, but she still put it. And, but that didn't matter too much because uh, uh, later she was also uh, fired from Google when looking for proofs in her own email about what happened with Tignet. But this is hard. So for example, uh, even when Google uh, tried to do an ethics board, they dissolved it in one week because they chose the wrong people. 
And one year ago, we wrote an algorithm, a paper, sorry, that is entitled Towards Intellectual Freedom in AI Ethics Global Community, that is in the Ethics and AI uh, Journal, and this is uh, open, so anyone can, can look at this. But I don't want to, to only pick in Google. This is not a Google problem only. For example, you have it in Amazon, you have it in Facebook, and the last one that we saw uh, because of COVID and, 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 and a singer or, or a podcaster was in a Spotify. So we are seeing this every, every time. Well, let's go to the second part. So the second part is, uh, uh, let me start with this, the seven properties that ACM uh, recommended for algorithm transparency and accountability. So soon the ACM will, will update these uh, properties. They will be a bit different. This was the first uh, attempt. But we need to remember that systems do not, do not need to be perfect. They can't. If they are learning from us, we are not perfect. But it seems that they need to be much better than us. And that's what people uh, expect from machines, that to be better than us. And, and it's like we, are, we need to play God. And this recent book by Cesar Hidalgo and, and collaborators on how humans judge machines shows this, that we have different expectations from humans and machines. So we have pragmatical questions. So to which part an idea, uh, a property applies? Which one is more important? Uh, do they make sense together? For example, transparency is something we ask in, in, in let's say Latin countries while accountability is something that all people expect in, in uh, Anglo-Saxon countries and so on. It's really a principle or an instrument to achieve a principle. So real principles are values. They don't have a goal. They don't have an instrument. So for example, you have autonomy coming from the Kant philosophy, or you have beneficence, no harm, that will be more from, from uh, bioethics, or you have justice fairness that, that has different instantiation depending on the culture. And we'll check that in soon. So I did some work on this trying to, to organize these things. And for example, these are ones that the instruments that I like. So one is the first one, legitimacy. So basically make sure that that the application should exist first before anything. You need to have uh, ethical and legal validity. You need to have scientific validity. You need to have the right to do, take the decision. You need to know the domain and so on. And then there are the things that are important, like everything about data, everything about the robustness of the system, everything about the interaction of the user with the system usability, everything about transparency, and everything about responsibility. So this is something I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. It's not yet finished, but I'm working on this. Other people is working on how to develop software that is trustworthy. I don't like to use trustworthy because we know that doesn't work all the time. So I prefer to use responsible AI. And uh, for example, the work of Ben Schneiderman that he just published a book called Human Centered AI on, on how to do this and on how to do the governance of software development to, do, to be responsible. Then we have uh, things related to to culture, for example, today we have a legal and ethical colonialism. Basically, we have either civil law, uh, like Roman law, either the common law from England or the Muslim law are taking all over the world. So we have like three main ways to see the law and the ethics. Uh, for example, here are different between the Christian, the Muslims, and the one in the right is the uh, coming from Confucius. And you see that there are different ways to see ethics, moral, and law. Also, we have geographical diversity. For example, here I like to, to mention Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a philosophy um, of the uh, South of Africa that says, I am because we are. So the, the focus is on the tribe, not on the person. And there's a very interesting uh, essay from Abeba Birhane that says that the scarte was wrong. A person is a person through other persons. And then you have issues about identity, data protection, and privacy. Here, I think I want to, to
to point out that that we have freedom of expression that says I can do everything that's not forbidden against things like GDPR, where I can do only things what is allowed. And when you have these two views of the world that are complementary, uh, typically they will clash at some point. You need to store the minimal data and you need to store for the minimal time. This is something like two, two very important things that you need to remember here. If you want to read more about privacy, I recommend the book by Carissa Belli, at least Privacy is Power. It has been translated to Portuguese and Spanish too. Well, GDPR is, was the first uh, large body regulation that basically in the Article 22 has this sentence that says that I have the right to contest the decision. So it has contestability. This, what does this mean for, uh, for, for us? It means that if you want to have transparency, you need to have interpret interpretability. If you really want to have contestability, you need to have explainability. However, you need to be aware that explainability in some cases could be dangerous, especially in health, because symptoms may be described for many different illnesses. And if you get the wrong one, then maybe some person will be harmed. And if you may want to make sure that the system works as intended, you need to do continuous validation, testing, and maintenance. So in, uh, in 2020, there was a very interesting case in the, in, in the France where a, a high court basically said that um, video surveillance was uh, illegal because of three important reasons. Competence, so they couldn't take the decision. Consent, they, they were not asking people if they, they were okay by videotaping them in public. And third, that the solution was not proportional to the goal. Basically, if you want to increase security schools, you just need a security guard not to do, do uh, video surveillance. Last year, uh, so uh, one year tomorrow, uh, the EU proposed the regulation for the use of AI. Here, the first problem is that we shouldn't be regulating the use of a technology. It's like regulating the, the, the hammer uh, and not regulating uh, the problem. So we should, for me, we should regulate education, uh, food, health. So we should regulate every sector independent of the technology we use to solve problems in that sector. But they already proposed this. They have a risk approach, and that's the, the next problem. Uh, and here there are some examples. For example, uh, Article 5 says that uh, you cannot use subliminal techniques to harm a person physically or psychologically. This is very hard to enforce because this means, for example, that, that I cannot put an ad on a burger to a person that has a metabolic problem or a cake for a person that has a diabetic problem. So, so it will be very hard to enforce. And, and yes, it's nice, uh, but it's not practical. And what happens with the risk? Well, risk is a continuous variable. And this is the problem when people use categories where there are any categories. This is the same as race. A skin color is a continuous. There is no point to try to, to have uh, these uh, boxes, buckets of different people. And if the same happens with risk, I already see people managing these this, uh, this, uh, definitions so you have the lowest risk possible for your application. So this will be. Uh, I think will be a game here. Then we have techniques that can help on this, like register algorithms. And then if you do register algorithms, you can audit algorithms. Uh, and, and this is very important, especially when you do it with the help of the company. This is an example that was published last year, was a hiring company. And, and they wanted to, to check if they fulfill a recommendation from the US government about gender uh, gender balance. Like, for example, 40 60, I think, is the balance between women and, and men. And they passed the audit and, and they agreed to publish the paper even before the audit. So, so this was an agreement. So, here's the paper. But, for example, some people criticized this paper, uh, I think, uh, in a reasonable sense, because by auditing this algorithm, they are justifying the techniques that they are using to screen people. And this, this uses the video games. 
And many people may believe that using video games to check if a person is better than other is not fair. So we are working in responsible AI in, in the Institute. So this is our, our big view of responsible AI. So we, we are looking at the roadmap and the roadmap has three parts. One is governance. One is a specific uh, risk assessment in a product or a project. And the third branch is the skills. How do we train people to understand how to develop responsible AI? Now, if you have some ethical issue, either in governance or, or in a product or a project, we are very soon launching the best ethics board in the world. So, so, so um, companies and other organizations can uh, demand some advice to this top uh, ethics board. And also, of course, we take care of audits and registry uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, doing uh, assessment on a product, for example. So to, to finish, um, remember systems are a mirror of us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The first thing to, to, to start solving the problem is to be aware of your biases and to be aware of your ethics. Uh, ethics is a network. So it doesn't matter how ethical are you if you are surrounded by people that don't have the same ethics or have lower ethics than you. So don't underestimate it. And there are many, many research problems here. For example, uh, Hazel Henderson asked, can AI algorithms ever be ethical? And a short answer could be no, because ethics is a human characteristic. Let's not try to apply human characteristics to machines. We are trying to uh, anthropomorphizing uh, things, and we are treating machines like people, and they are not. And finally, David Lauer says something very important that someone has to say it. It's obvious, but someone has to say it is you cannot have AI ethics without ethics. This is what uh, we need to make sure it's true. So uh, the two main conferences in this field start in 2018. One is the AAAI ACM Conference on AI, Ethics, and Society. And, and the other one is a uh, fact, is the Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. So I don't know if we have time for questions. We do, we do. We do, and we do have many questions. And I, and, um, I'm very glad that Juan Pavon could join us. Hello, Juan. How are Hello. you? I'm happy to be here. I was a bit late, sorry, because some um, uh, personal issues, but finally I succeeded to arrive 10 minutes late. But anyway, thank you, Ricardo, for your talk. So I, I will, um, do you have any questions? I have lots of questions, but uh, since you are our invitee, I am giving you the the first place to ask questions to Ricardo. Oui. I would like to be for several hours with Ricardo having a dinner or something like that to discuss many, many things. No, In fact, this subject is, is very, very relevant now. My first question is very, very general. And this is because, uh, okay, we are very worried about ethics with artificial intelligence systems, but we have also <laughs> algorithms, uh, non-intelligent non or not so smart, uh, and we were not worried about ethics in, in previous systems, no? or at least not as much as we do now. So the, this is a very general question or maybe philosophical, but why are we now really worried about that and not with more traditional systems? Yeah, the very, very good question, Juan, because we, we already had some problem with some, uh, for example, ex expert systems in the past and other, other automated ways to support or take decisions. The reason I think the difference uh, uh, today is that first, there is a boom of AI that is uh, increased by a hype of AI. So we have so many applications, much more than before, uh, that, that we need to deal with. 
And some people forget that when you have something that grows exponentially, for example, also the problems will grow exponentially. And we are seeing this exponential growth. This is like COVID. The COVID, if you don't take care of it, can, can basically infect people exponentially, at, at least at the beginning. And then the same happens in AI. So as I said, we had more than 2,000 incidents already recorded. But these are the ones we know. Many more there exist, and we don't know them. Maybe more than 10,000. So this is something that you see one news per day, at least, in, 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 in only in the US. But so we have a problem and we need to basically uh, make people aware of this problem. So we think more about deploying the systems uh, before uh, the, the people. Well, I think that part of the issue is because uh, uh, when we think about artificial intelligence systems, we are giving them uh, some autonomy, you know? And maybe because we are giving autonomy, we are delegating. Eh? Yes. So too much uh, personal control on them, no? So maybe this is part also of, of the of the reason. I don't know. What do you think? No, yes. Uh, I think uh, one part of the problem is that, that uh, is uh, making them human. So if you give autonomy to them, you are making them human because autonomy is a human trait. Mm -hmm. so, so that's part of the problem. Also, you say something like, it's like I, was, I guess it's a, it's a cognitive bias there. When we delegate to machines, we feel that we also are less accountable for that. We can always blame the machine and say, oh, yeah, the yeah. algorithm made, made a mistake, but you are taking the decision of delegating, so you mm -hmm. should be accountable. And this is something that, that is a quality bias, two quality bias. One is that we believe, we tend to believe that they are right, so we, we believe in their predictions more than we should. And mm -hmm. second, we are, we are like washing our hands because they are taking the decision. I think yeah. these are two quality bias that are mm -hmm. happening all the time. This is yeah. why you say that you, your lab is um, uh, preaching human in control, not only human in the loop, right? Exactly. If we, if we are playing God, the, the least thing I will expect is that you're in control. Because then, if that's not the case, it's a very weak God. It's not a God. It's that <laughs> just you are, you are doing something, okay, oh, let's, let's hope it works. No, we should be in control to say, okay, if when doesn't work, will be accountable, will be responsible. And also we need to make sure that it works because we cannot be harming people uh, No, This is uh, also because um, there's another issue that is uh, hidden here I haven't mentioned is that ethics, ethics is always running behind technology. So basically people don't think about the consequences mm -hmm. in advance. So for example, after the Germans use uh, chemical weapons in the First World War, we said, okay, no, mass, no more chemical weapons. After the U.S. used uh, uh, two atomic bombs in Japan in the Second World War, we said, okay, no more atomic bombs, and we still have mm -hmm. managed that, although that's always like flaky. But in the case of uh, AI, it's, 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 it's like a bomb, but for me, it's like a cluster bomb. It, it goes everywhere. And we need to say, okay, let's stop this uh, dangerous cluster bomb, because at some point we will, we will harm too many people. Yes. Uh, let, let, let me just just and, and ask a small question before I, I hand it over to Juan. Uh, my question is concerning bias, right? Oh, so I don't believe, actually, I, I believe that any set of data, any, has bias. So there is no data without bias. Correct, yes. So for me, it's impossible to have an unbiased AI. It's going to be biased, and hopefully, so so you agree with me, okay? Yes. So this was my question. Yes, yeah, but 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 the important thing is what I said during the presentation is that the you, that's true, but we need to remember that bias is not always negative. So so having biased data is not a problem in itself. The problem is what happens when with the negative part of that. So for example, we can have a gender parity bias. It yeah, should be acceptable, can, exactly. culturally acceptable, right? Yeah, so we need to have basically the output. Also, we, we don't want to replicate the past because if we replicate the past, then we the future will be the same. So we need to basically do something to avoid the negative biases and, and, and amplify the good biases. Mm -hmm. One, again, 
Well, something related with duration bytes, no? And it's also a bit general, no? Because usually we want to <coughs> automate, or we would like to automate somehow the verification that the system has no bias, no? So the thing is that we need to specify somehow what are our ethical rules or not, because finally, uh, I think that many of these things will finish uh, with lawyers <laughs> discussing whether the system has bias or not, and so on. No, so the thing is that it's very, very difficult to, to specify uh, the, the problem. No? For instance, if we want, in the case you, the typical cases that, for instance, Ricardo has been mentioned about uh, race bias in, in for penals and so on. Uh, how do we specify this if we want to automate the process no how we can specify that the system is not having for instance race bias or economical for some uh, economical class people or for some specific things no i i know one thing is that is uh, the, the the specification cannot be complete no but how can we specify for instance uh, race bias and then how can we apply some tools to check that in an automated way? So it's a very good question because there are many questions hidden in that question. So, so yes. the, first, the first one I will say, let's start with the beginning. I will say um, there are many applications that we shouldn't use it. So, so one way to, to solve a problem is uh, don't, don't do it. For example, uh, as I said, anything that has to do with justice when, when we are dealing with an individual decision and we are transforming that individual decision in a group decision like we're averaging the decision that that if you read the law that's illegal but uh, but this hasn't been contested yet so for many things that are applied to humans especially individual decisions we should we shouldn't use ai because then we are not being fair with the person by by principle the second thing is that if, if it's okay to use the AI, uh, there are many decisions that cannot be taken by computer scientists, that there are decisions that can, can have been need to be taken by ethicists, by, by the organization itself, or by even by society, for example, about gender or, or, or other <laughs> important uh, biases. The third problem there is that um, sometimes we don't know the biases, so we don't know what to set. So the biases are discovered later because of a problem that no one ever thought, and this is the case of the delivery example, that no one thought that, that balance in the world was important because they never thought that that would happen uh, because of the optimization function that will be used. And then, and then even when we can uh, have some fairness measures, so because one way to, to decide what will be fair, for example, we can always say, let's say we use it for justice although we shouldn't use it we can always say okay we cannot increase the the unfairness of the judges for example that we can put that rule we, we shouldn't be more unfair than judges this could be or we could say we should be uh, neutral and then keep the same percentage of uh, ethnic uh, origins that come in the input we can decide these things the problem with that is that Fairness can be defined in many, many ways, and there is, there is a very recent article that is called the impossibility of fairness, because we can optimize for one fairness measure, and for sure we are not optimizing for many others that are valid. So at the end, you are fair with some people, and you are unfair with other people. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the problem today, and, and, and this is life. Like every, every time in life when you are trying to be fair, you are fair with that person, but probably you will be uh, being unfair with another person if, if that person were, were here. Yeah, because in fact, you mentioned that there are many different kinds of ethical systems. We could have utilitarian, Ubuntu, etc. and so on. Uh, and this problem, in fact, what we have is a problem of uh, what uh, ethical system we have uh, towards making decisions, no? So maybe we can specify that or at least when we are going to use a, a, a decision system based on artificial intelligence and rules or something to to know which is the the kind of ethics that we have if, uh, behind no yes. and how uh, and this is something that should be documented or somehow no 
Yeah, I think yeah. The, the best example of this is bioethics. So in medicine, it's very clear what is the, the, the ethics code uh, of uh, medicine. But but this is a good example in the sense that, that we should do that per sector, per problem, not, not generalized to all AI. So for example, if we have an ethics for, for, for medicine, we can have an ethics for, for example, for food, and then it doesn't matter what technology you use to produce food, it's the same ethics, the same for education, the same for logistics. So we need to have these uh, different, different ethics that, that are tailored to the problem and also even to the culture, because uh, as, as, uh, like, for example, maybe in Germany, they, they are more aggressive by driving, but in India, for sure, it should be different because they want to save cows and other things that are maybe in the road. Mm -hmm. Even like that, it's always difficult because, for instance, if you have, uh, in a, you mentioned, for instance, in medicine, no? If you have to decide, uh, you have to make a donation of an organ and you have someone uh, 60 years old with uh, a very high percentage of uh, compatibility and you have someone 16 years old, very young, but with only 20% of uh, possibility for success on, on the operation and so on. So, where do you establish which are the the different uh, with the different uh, fa criteria factors? Some of them can be quantified with numbers, but some of them are not so easy to, yeah. to quantify. No, and and okay, you you may decide okay, I'm going to have an utilitarian uh, ethical system and so on, but where do you, how do you combine all this, no? So... Yeah, no, I think, I think we need to, if we do the right thing, and we should wait for every sector to define this code, not, not us. So, so, for example, in bioethics, it's already set up. This was the Helsinki declaration, where the last one that was, uh, the last modification was in 2013. So medicine has very clear what are the ethics principles. But we need the same... And, and this is interesting because it's also a, a, a global agreement. So basically all countries agree on this, which is also very hard because you can agree that, for example, you can have the Brazilian ethics in food, but maybe different from the European Union ethics in food. And then we need to agree on that. So this is another problem we have. We need the global agreement on this thing. So this, this will have, I think will take long. And, and, and I think right now they are going in the wrong direction. For example, they are doing this, um, regulation for, for the whole use of AI that will be similar to GDPR in the sense that the GDPR regulates a problem like data protection. But for example, it's a one shoe fits all. Uh, the kiosk of the corner that sells uh, journals has to comply to the same uh, law that uh, the multinational in Dublin complies. And that doesn't make much sense to me. That, that basically one person company has to do the same, uh, uh, for example, take care of the same data, like for example, data for, from customers than let's say a uh, internet uh, guide. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to be the only one to ask questions. Maybe there are some people who wanted to. Yes, is there any people from YouTube? Any other question, Marisa? No questions from YouTube. Okay, so, but I think we are out of time. Are we, Marisa? Yes, two minutes left. Okay, so... I'm sorry, I'm sorry of the problem we had with the slides. Uh, uh, usually I use Zoom, never have this problem, but, but I guess StreamYard uh, didn't have the, the right to share the whole screen. I don't know why, it's a, a problem with my Mac. I will try to fix it. Later. Yeah, it's always uh, like a challenge. So yes, no problem. Yeah. Your talk was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for accepting. You know, and I hope you we can you know meet meet again to talk more about this wonderful talk. Marisa, yeah. I would like you to put the our the invitation for our next speaker. That's going to be. We will meet in Cartagena, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Jose Ma Molina, very, very nice person. <laughs> yes. Very so good and very, very funny. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ricardo, I hope we can meet in Cartagena de Indias. I would love to, yes. Yeah. We will be there. Yeah. I think it's, it's a very good initiative, this one of uh, making this kind of uh, species uh, before the conference. Yes. Yeah. Very, very interesting idea. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, our next speaker is Jose Manuel Molina Lopez from Universidad de Carlos III that's going to talk about explainable artificial intelligence. And uh, we are going to update in the site. It's going to be May 31st at 2 p.m. So 2 p.m. Brazilian time. <laughs> It's difficult to put the dates for everybody. I, yeah. I thought that today was at 18 in the page, and finally it was 19. But anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Pavon. I hope we are, well, for sure, we are going to meet in Cartagena. Yes. And... Are you too, no, Ricardo? I will try to go, yes. Yes. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Bye-bye, Marisa. Bye-bye.